Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. So you think your house is haunted? Congratulations, you probably have a lot of questions. You may be wondering why your house is haunted, but it would behoove you to also know how your house is haunted before speculating the why. There are a number of different ways one can experience paranormal activity, and asking why and how can help you get to the root of the haunting. All things considered, paranormal activity can simply be defined as energy happening in a place or manner that it shouldn't be happening. Your house, for instance. Your house is not haunted if you find an air vent over a cold spot you're feeling nauseated and happen to live across from a power plant, or you have a psychological condition that produces hallucinations, or are experimenting with drugs. If dishes are flying across your kitchen, or a see-through person is standing at the edge of your bed staring at you, these are some telltale signs your house is indeed probably haunted. But first, never underestimate the power of debunking. Much of what may be considered paranormal may also be just the energies brought forth by architecture, atmospheric conditions, and pareidolia. Our brains and bodies in and of themselves are fascinating things that can produce fascinating interpretations of what may be otherwise benign scientific situations. Try to assume the energy in question is benign. It's a raccoon in the attic, an open vent, a leaky pipe, before assuming it's a full-blown demonic possession more on that later. Let's start by breaking down some of the most common types of hauntings with some basic paranormal lingo. Poltergeist activity. Literally noisy ghost in German. Cupboards open on their own, books fall off a shelf, or perhaps slime drips off the ceiling. If all other natural phenomena can be debunked, like you're not experiencing an earthquake or bad plumbing, you can probably assume something supernatural is going on. There's ample research out there suggesting the person experiencing the haunting themselves could be the poltergeist agent. That is, he or she creates the phenomenon with unconscious psychic proclivities. Dr. Barry Taff has an excellent book on this called Aliens Above, Ghosts Below, if you want to further study this type of phenomenon. I'll leave a link to that book in the show description. Residual Haunting also known as stone tape theory. This refers to a psychically charged event that is essentially played back under certain conditions. Think phantom footsteps, an apparition that walks through walls without interacting with the viewer, even a feeling of uneasiness in an area where someone was murdered. Nothing conscious is attempting to contact the witness. The environment literally sucked up whatever sudden or repetitive energy happened and spewed it back out. Battlefields are a prime example of the powers of residual energies. Sensitive people may feel a tightening around their throat in an area where someone was hanged a century ago. They may feel a stabbing pain in their rib cage in an area of an abandoned hospital where lobectomies were performed. They're simply picking up on a psychic imprint left behind in the atomic fabric of the space. There's not much you can do about these types of hauntings, because they are embedded into the very history of the environment. They may decay over time, but chances are you're stuck with it. Thought forms, 
also known as egregores. This is a more psychic phenomenon in which inexperienced folks with negative intentions conjured up some nastiness in their basement that is wreaking havoc on their lives now. Some ghost hunters or TV personalities will call these demons or malevolent entities. This is not the ghost of a bad person. This is the collective plume of negative energy that manifests as, for instance, a black shadow figure crawling around on the ceiling. These are contaminated, collective manifestations brought forth by inexperienced ghost hunters provoking a space, or kids with Ouija boards who don't know what they're doing. There's no need to personalize these energies, as they were never human to begin with. It's similar to a residual haunting, but there is an element of ancient occultism that warrants additional research. Mallory Kwasinski's book Making Friends with Ghosts offers a unique perspective on the egregore phenomenon. I'll link to that book in the episode description as well. Synchronicity This is a divine coincidence that something from the other side has manipulated the environment in such a way that you know it is a sign that the person or animal is making intelligent contact. These are the beautifully spooky occurrences that puzzle us to our core and make us say things like, you can't make this stuff up. Synchronicities can indicate the presence of guardian angels. They are highly personalized, subtle yet profound, and offer a hint at hidden laws of collective consciousness. The Synchronicity Key is a fantastic book by author-researcher David Wilcock that can shed more light on this beautiful phenomenon. Link in the episode description. A Class A Intelligent Haunting This is the stuff of Hollywood and lore passed down from generations. This is Grandma walking through the living room and disappearing into the TV set six months after she died. This is the best friend from childhood who called you after you had just attended her funeral. This is the figure in the SLS camera who waves at you while simultaneously saying hello in the spirit box while simultaneously kicking the bottom of your chair. It may very well be a one-time thing, but it will leave a lasting impression on you for life. This is a conscious, intelligent, purposeful connection from the beyond. If you see this kind of stuff on a daily basis, not only is your space potentially haunted, but you may potentially be haunted as well. You might even have some psychic medium abilities. Now that we know the how of the haunting, let's walk through a scenario together to see if we can A. Debunk the occurrence, B. Identify the type of haunting, and C. Figure out what the heck to do about it. You've noticed a chair in your basement seemingly tips over on its own. In fact, you've seen it happen yourself. Let's do a little paranormal root cause analysis to figure out what's going on. Is there an air vent present and the chair is blowing over? Is the floor crooked or is one of the legs broken? Is there an animal in the basement knocking it over? Suggesting a benign, non-haunted situation. Does it only happen under certain circumstantial conditions, that is, at night, on Thursdays, or after you had tacos for dinner? That might suggest a residual haunting. Does it only happen in correlation to a family member's presence and or an emotional outburst within the home? Suggesting poltergeist. What's the history of the chair? Did it belong to your great-grandmother? Did you find it at a rummage sale? Did your dad build it? Suggesting residual, but perhaps synchronicity, depending on the circumstances, like if it falls over on what would have been her birthday, etc. When you witness the chair fall over, does the environment change? Is it cold? Does your skin feel prickly? Suggesting residual, but possibly intelligent if further interaction amps up. Let's videotape that sucker on night vision so we can see into a different light spectrum. Are there any light anomalies or unexplainable shadows near the chair, suggesting intelligent or perhaps a thought form? Did the previous owner of the house experience anything in the basement, or did the previous owner of the house die in the basement, suggesting residual? Is the house built on a fault line or near water or a sacred historical burial site? What are the geological energies present in the area? suggesting residual but also could be benign in nature and debunked. Before you call in the ghost hunters, see if you can figure out the nature of the phenomenon yourself. 
We're fortunate to live in a time where discussing the supernatural is not so taboo, and chances are we won't be burned at the stake for questioning the teachings of religion, science, philosophy, and the very fabric of reality as we know it. If you think your house is haunted, asking how will prompt your brain to compartmentalize the experience into cognitively digestible parts. The how is influenced by process and procedure, not philosophy or rationalization. How did the phenomenon present itself? A repetitive noise? A dip in temperature? A blip of light in an area where no such electrical source exists? If you think your house is haunted, asking why will prompt the imaginative, speculative part of your brain. The why is influenced by awareness and driven by belief, the bigger picture, the desire to connect with something philosophical or theological in nature, like it's grandma trying to contact me, or the spirit is angry at us for disturbing its former house. I would exercise caution in this regard, as we truly should not project our human feelings on an environment where nothing around you is alive anymore. Who are we to assume a ghost still has unresolved feelings or emotions? Why do we think the dead have the same agenda we do, that they have the same emotions that they did when they were alive? By instead recognizing the paranormal as energy, whose presence and manifestation we can't yet explain, rather than the dead projecting their feelings, hauntedness doesn't seem that, well, scary. So you think your house is haunted? Embrace it. You're either gifted as sensitive and or worthy enough by some other force to recognize the phenomenon. The universe has winked at you. Are you ready to wink back? For thousands of years, mythologies and legends around the world have told of powerful, otherworldly beings who descended from the heavens to interact with humans on Earth. Known as the Anunnaki in ancient Mesopotamian texts, these mysterious entities were revered as gods by the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. But what if they weren't myths at all? What if the Anunnaki were real, extraterrestrial beings who came to Earth in the distant past and never left? While mainstream scholars continue to dismiss tales of the Anunnaki as mere mythology, some researchers believe there is compelling evidence that these ancient visitors wielded great influence over early human civilizations. Zechariah Sitchin, a scholar who devoted his life to translating ancient Sumerian and Akkadian texts, controversially proposed that the Anunnaki came to Earth over 400,000 years ago from the planet Nibiru. Sitchin's translations describe how the Anunnaki genetically engineered modern humans to serve as their laborers. While Sitchin's theory remains hotly debated, those who believe the Anunnaki were more than myth cite a number of anomalous archaeological sites and artifacts in support of their claims. For example, the megalithic structures at Gobekli Tepe in southern Turkey were built around 12,000 years ago, far before the accepted origin of civilization. The incredibly precise and intricate stonework seems unfathomable for Neolithic humans. Some suggest Gobekli Tepe may have been established or guided by the otherworldly knowledge of the Anunnaki. The same could be said for ancient marvels like the Great Pyramids in Egypt, whose construction methods continue to baffle modern engineers. How did ancient peoples move and position massive blocks of limestone and granite with such precision? Were they helped by advanced technology from celestial visitors? Some theorists point to strange artifacts housed in museums around the world as proof of the Anunnaki's presence on Earth. The Saqqara bird, discovered in the sands of Egypt, resembles a modern airplane, complete with wings and the suggestion of a fuselage. How could ancient humans have designed something seemingly mimicking modern flight? But the biggest question is, could the Anunnaki still be here today, subtly shaping humanity's development in the shadows? While we treat legends of almighty gods descending from the sky as mere fables, perhaps we ignore these stories at our peril. If the Anunnaki walked among ancient humankind, 
why couldn't their descendants continue to dwell among us? Some believe figures like Thoth and Quetzalcoatl, gods who supposedly taught human beings math, science, and philosophy in antiquity, were really Anunnaki, sharing a portion of their advanced knowledge. And if they revealed some of their secrets thousands of years ago, why wouldn't they continue to share their wisdom with certain segments of the human population today? In fact, some theorize that the Anunnaki never vanished because we can see them every day. Many of the world's elite political and financial leaders from secret societies like the Illuminati, the Freemasons, and the Bilderberg Group are said to be the mortal agents of otherworldly Anunnaki overlords. These shadowy organizations pull the strings of modern civilization, subtly giving us just enough technology to keep us compliant workers while hoarding their true scientific breakthroughs, said to be given directly to them by their alien masters working covertly behind the scenes. While none of these ideas can be proven definitively, the mere possibility is enough to make one wonder. Could ancient aliens really have visited our planet in its primitive past, kickstarting human civilization as we know it? Did they tinker with early hominids to fashion modern humans in their own image? And if the Anunnaki existed in antiquity, who's to say they ever actually left? They could still be here today, hiding in plain sight, surreptitiously overseeing the progress of the civilization they created. One thing is certain. If the Anunnaki are real, their true nature and relationship with humankind is something we have scarcely begun to understand. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. All things that pass through a woman's looking-glass, they show her how her bloom must fade, and she herself be laid with withered roses in the shade. Passing and Glassing, a poem by Christina Rossetti Have you ever heard the paranormal theory that suggests mirrors can become portals to the spirit world? Many believe that the reflective surfaces of mirrors connect as doorways for spiritual energy to pass through. The potential of this is chilling by anyone's standards. Could our fascination with this haunting idea be a product of folklore and superstitions, or could there really be something sinister lurking beyond the glass surface? The notion that mirrors are connected to the paranormal is nothing new. In fact, it can be traced back as early as 1800 BC to the Mayan civilization, the Mayans firmly believed that mirrors and reflective surfaces were entrances to spiritual realms. Depictions of Mayan deities would often have mirrors painted around them in artwork and throughout religious records. This strong connection between the spirit world and the mirror would later resurface in countless cultures throughout history. What is quite interesting is how many countries and religions recognized a connection between the mirror and the afterlife. This awareness would prompt people to create superstitions to protect themselves from paranormal prospects. A common practice of covering mirrors would surface in Jewish funeral rituals as well as Catholic services. Evidence of mirrors being covered after death 
can be observed all around the world in places such as China, Europe, and North America. As mirrors became more common in homes and establishments throughout time, so did the superstitions and practices regarding their connections to the afterlife. Many believed that a soul would linger close to the body after death before ascending into the afterlife. It was thought that the mirror could distract the spirit from the path they were meant to take if they caught a glimpse of themselves, ultimately trapping them in the physical world or within the mirror itself. In addition to protecting the deceased, many felt that by covering the mirror they protected the living as well. Some believed that the act of someone dying could summon spirits within the mirror that could possibly capture unsuspecting living relatives. Both beliefs of the paranormal were enough to fuel the superstition throughout the years. Origins of covering mirrors after death can be found in the United States as early as the 1780s when artist Prudence Punderson depicted the practice in her ominous needlework piece The First, Second, and Last Scene of Mortality. In this piece that she completed just before her own death, the macabre theme is evident. One can observe her coffin, and just above it there is a mirror covered with a white cloth. Punderson was not the only American to partake in this ritual. With many dead from diseases, wars, and lack of access to modern medicine, funerals in the United States were a regular occurrence. Many families would commonly hold funeral services in their own homes, so this practice was considered highly important to protect the deceased's loved one's soul. The notion of a spiritual connection with mirrors has seeped into the fabric of popular folklore as well. The story of Bloody Mary being conjured in the mirror is a story many might find familiar. The daring tale has been told countless times at sleepovers over the years. Young people take turns passing down the legend in dimly lit rooms, usually illuminated only by a candle. They then try their luck in front of a mirror by repeating her name three times. Bloody Mary! Bloody Mary! Bloody Mary! While little evidence suggests this legend has any tangible truth behind it, the game exists as a rite of passage for many thrill-seekers. While old houses and buildings are often categorized as commonly haunted spaces, mirrors can also join the ranks as commonly haunted objects. Perhaps it has something to do with the rich historic connections believed by so many cultures, or perhaps it has something to do with the very fabric of the spiritual veil itself. Mirrors are oftentimes the subject of spiritual activity reported in recent years across the paranormal landscape. Establishments such as the Stanley Hotel, the Roosevelt Hotel, and Zach Baggins Museum are some of the many well-known places that boast of owning a haunted mirror. This phenomenon begs the question as to what it is about the mirror itself that could make it a candidate for a haunting. Could a tragic event that occurred in close proximity to the mirror somehow cause the hauntings? Another avenue for this topic rests in the idea that some believe the physical materials are to blame. Solid wood frames are capable of absorbing energy, much like a sponge can absorb water. The wood and silver glass act as conductors that can in turn transfer such energy. While most of us love a chilling ghost story surrounding a mirror, is it possible that we could unknowingly invite the narrative into our own homes? Paranormal activity is certainly not cut and dry in many cases, but mirrors could pose a potential risk when it comes to ghostly home invasions. Some paranormal investigators find that residences with two or more mirrors facing one another have the potential power to open a portal. Said portals allow for a myriad of spirits to enter and exit the home posing a potential threat to whoever resides in the space. Whether or not this is true is certainly up for debate. Personally, I tend to err on the side of safety, so ensuring no mirrors face one another in my home feels like a good paranormal feng shui. Wherever you stand on the topic of these mirror theories, one thing may be easy for everyone to agree on. Locations that exist today with reports of paranormal activity often have something in common they have mirrors. In many cases, plenty of them. Could it be possible that spirits have an open door to sneak back into the world of the living in this manner? This is certainly an interesting topic to chew on next time you catch your reflection in the mirror. Maybe if you stare long enough, you might just catch a misty apparition 
gazing back at you. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.